Prostitution is often called the world's oldest profession, and for good reason. Descriptions of sex work can be found dating back to the invention of writing. Throughout the history of humankind, the love for money has always been, although frowned upon, incredibly popular. This is why in most countries the sale of intimacy is mentioned in laws, but in practice the authorities don't always do much about it. Of course, some countries have tried to integrate prostitution into their societal frameworks. Their logic is simple. Two grown adults have the right to engage in any activity they please, as long as they both consent. Currently, sex trade is officially permitted in 53 countries, from Canada to New Zealand. In Europe, this work is only allowed in Greece, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Latvia, Hungary, and Turkey. Turkey's situation is particularly interesting. The thing is that during the height of the Ottoman Empire, when Suleiman the Magnificent ruled, prostitution reached phenomenal levels, despite the prohibitions of Islam. If everyone agreed with regard to marriage, divorce, and adultery, everything became much more complicated when it came to prostitution. The laws of that time could not determine how immoral prostitution was and what the punishment for it should be. As it turned out, the officials in charge of such decisions received bribes from the women in exchange for an action on the matter, and many of them were themselves clients of these women. Naturally, this situation couldn't satisfy everyone, and eventually it reached a breaking point. According to legend, it all began in 1565 in the Eup region, where the tomb of the celebrated Prophet Muhammad was located. The locals watched as five women of loose morals openly called to those who had made the journey to the holy site. There had been complaints about the women, so they were summoned to an interrogation with a caddy, a Muslim judge. One of the accused refused to come. When the judge went to her house, the women readily shared her life story. Her husband was a janissary. Like all soldiers of that time, he was constantly on military campaigns and couldn't provide for his family. She couldn't wait around for help, so she turned to sex work, which became her only way of earning a living. Unfortunately, the story didn't convince Suleiman who ordered that all of the accused be sent away to the distant provinces of the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan couldn't execute the guilty. In order to exercise capital punishment, he would have to get permission from the experts on Shari law. But even their relatively mild punishment had an effect on the people, and they began to emulate the example of the head of state. Thus, Suleiman's Grand Vizier, Lufti Pasha, declared himself the enemy of the sex trade in Istanbul, and ordered that all prostitutes should have their sex organs burned off. But he had made this decision without consulting anyone. His wife, Sahi Huban, who was also Suleiman's sister, became terribly angry at her husband's willfulness. The whole country was shocked by the news of his cruel punishment, but Lufti Pasha was unconcerned. Then his wife demanded an explanation from him, threatening divorce. Thanks to their lineage, all Sahi Huban had to do to annul the marriage was repeat, I divorce you, three times. And the Grand Vizier's career, whose position was comparable to a modern-day prime minister, would be over. Furious with her threats, Lufti Pasha struck his wife. A servant saw this scandalous act and reported it to the Sultan. The leader immediately revoked all of Lufti Pasha's privileges and exiled him to the small village of Didimateko. After Suleiman's death, his son Selim II issued a decree. All women engaging in prostitution would be added to a registry and sent to prison. Judging from the surviving documents, the wording of the decree was rather vague, and actually resulted only in the criminalization of procurement of sex workers, while prostitution itself remained legal. In the end, the fight against the sex trade was unsuccessful. Local officials preferred to turn a blind eye to the activities of these loose women in exchange for a modest fee. The absurd situation reached its apex in the 18th century when women of pleasure could be found in almost every district of Istanbul. The women sold themselves in cafes, poorly disguising themselves as laundresses and saleswomen. At the same time, the governor of Damascus capitalized on the situation. He overturned Selim II's decree and instead ordered all prostitutes to pay a monthly fee. Periodically, Ottoman judges would round up prostitutes and send them to distant islands, but the exiled criminals were poorly guarded. As soon as possible, they would return and carry on their business as usual. Eventually, the citizens of Istanbul became fed up and went to complain to the Sultan himself, Abdul Hamid I. The head of the Ottoman Empire ordered that all prostitutes be imprisoned. However, the phenomenon was so widespread that soon all of the city's prisons became overcrowded. The cost of sustaining the prisoners depleted the treasury, and the Sultan had no choice but to let everyone go, but not before arranging a public execution of some of the most popular sex workers. The final attempt at eradicating prostitution came from Sultan Abdulaziz. In 1870, he ordered all detained women be brought to a hospital located in a charity center across from the Hurram Mosque. There, prostitutes were provided clothing, food, and medicine. They were also assigned guards, so the hospital became a sort of prison. The 20th century brought the Europeanization of the country, and foreigners were allowed to conduct business without any permission or any restriction from the Sultan. They easily opened brothels on the streets of Istanbul. The fight against this vice soon became pointless. 
This arrangement remains to this day. When Mershep Erdogan, an ardent supporter of the country's Islamization, came to power in 2014, he launched a violent campaign against the brothels. However, supporters of a secular lifestyle argued that the ban wouldn't eradicate prostitution, but only drive it into the shadows just like in past centuries. And they succeeded. Today, Turkey is the only Muslim country where sex work is legal. In other countries, the fight against this societal vice has an equally long history. For example, the authorities of medieval mines and Strasbourg set up an entire system for controlling sex workers. Everything was recorded, from their age and health status to their place of residence and average income. Strict statuses regulated how the prostitutes could dress, ensuring they could be easily distinguished from decent women. In addition to women, the Strasbourg morality police also controlled men. Entrance into brothels was not allowed for clergy, married men, or non-Christians, Jews, Turks, and Moors. These restrictions led to an increase in professional pimps and madams, which also generated pushback. Systematic searches carried out in all parts of the city sought to catch those violators of decency who operated their business outside of specially designated areas. In addition to the executions, which were standard in the Middle Ages, punishments meant to defame honor were also used. These punishments varied throughout Europe. In Frankfurt, convicted women were chained to a stake and publicly shamed. In southern Germany, they were made to ride in a prostitute carriage. In France, captured sex workers were ridden through the whole city on a donkey or horse sitting facing the tail. And in Vienna, they were forced to carry a a heavy stone from one end of the capital to the other. Over time, Austria was able to incorporate prostitution into its laws. In the 14th century, women of the night were able to peacefully go about their business. They simply had to pay a regular tax and leave the cities on Sundays and during Great Lent. But soon began an era of religious influence. The Austrian Duke Albrecht III's advisor set up a charity fund for prostitutes who decided to renounce sin and take a righteous path. These repentant women lived in a private home where they were free to do as they wished, except for work in taverns or in trade. The women were left without strict supervision and were trained in no new skills. As a result, the Duke's advisors soon realized that their shelter had been turned into another brothel. In the Russian Empire, Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich declared war on prostitution by putting forward his cathedral code. This most complete set of laws from the Moscow government prohibited, among other things, promiscuity and procuring. And in the Order on the Diocese, guards were instructed to strictly monitor the streets to ensure they were free of women of loose morals. The real prostitution boom came with the rule of Peter the Great. Russia was overwhelmed with reforms, and St. Petersburg was inundated with foreigners, who mostly settled in a historical area of Moscow which came to be known as the Foreigner's District. Along with European knowledge, they brought European entertainment in the form of brothels. Tsar Peter also borrowed one method of combating prostitution from neighboring countries, setting up correctional institutions. In 1721, the Tsar founded the so-called spin houses, yarn spinning factories. There, the prostitutes were taught how to make fabric by Dutch craftsmen. Linen was collected from linen factories and new products were returned to them. These factories for yarn production were another type of hard labor and the women were treated accordingly. They were only provided with food. It's worth noticing that if some of the sex workers decided to start a new life, factory owners would still refuse to hire them, forcing them to return to their old profession. After Peter the Great's death, the fight against prostitution intensified. In a decree from May 6, 1736, innkeepers and homeowners were forbidden from keeping lewd girls on pain of whipping and deprivation of housing. As a preventative measure, Empress Elizaveta Petrovna forbade men and women from visiting public baths together. But this wasn't enough to curb prostitution. In addition to the rampant promiscuity, venereal diseases were also spreading. A decree from 1750 ordered police officers to detain prostitutes and force them into free treatment at Kalinkin House, the Russian Empire's first venereal disease hospital. Although Catherine the Great took the first steps to legalize prostitution, women were exiled to Siberia en masse from Moscow and St. Petersburg starting in 1800. In 1839, women offering sexual services were recruited into corrective labor, sweeping the streets and washing the floors in public places. Then in 1843 came a breakthrough for personal freedoms. The Ministry of Internal Affairs decided to take an approach adopted from overseas in the fight against prostitution. They suggested that Emperor Nicholas I create committees of doctors and police officers. These institutions would take control of the sex workers. In May of 1844 came the laws for proprietors of brothels. This document actually legalized brothels in the Russian Empire. Regulations for brothels were quite strict and were conducive to safe practice of the profession. Consequently, many girls from poverty became prostitutes. At the time of these committee's creations, around 400 women were registered. By 1852, their number had increased to 1,075. And after another 27 years, in 1879, St. Petersburg alone had 206 brothels and 1,500 sex workers. 
Over time, the brothels began to vary in client status and level of service. The cheap brothels attracted criminals, which brought up the crime rate in St. Petersburg. The authorities gradually forced the brothels to the outskirts, away from the city center. By 1909, only 32 brothels and just over 300 prostitutes remained in the capital. However, this doesn't mean that sex workers all switched professions. On the contrary, most of taking up illegally soliciting themselves, finding clients on the streets. Unofficial data suggests that in 1910, at least 40,000 prostitutes lived in St. Petersburg. It was simply impossible for the police to deal with so much illegal activity, so they chose to ignore it. After the revolution of 1917, the Soviet government decided to rehabilitate the prostitutes. Corrective labor camps were opened for them, which by the 30s had become the equivalent of prisons. Under Stalin, in the time of the Great Terror, prostitutes and pimps were tried for counter-revolutionary activity. The corresponding statute in the criminal code called for the death penalty. And so the sex trade went deep underground, not emerging again until the 90s. Today in Russia, engaging in prostitution only results in a fine, similar to the punishment for speeding. Whether or not that constitutes a victory is controversial, as those on both sides of the issue of legalization will have strong arguments. What do you think? Is it worth it to prohibit prostitution, or is it a normal and acceptable part of society? Write your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like, share this video with your friends, and subscribe to Simple Infographic. We'll see you in the next episode.